Chapter 21 of The Famous Men of Rome This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher Famous Men of Rome by John A. Heron and A. B. Poland Chapter 21 Julius Caesar 1. Of all the Roman heroes, the greatest was Gaius Julius Caesar. He was a very remarkable man in many ways. He was remarkable as a soldier, statesman, scholar, and as an orator. He wrote a history of his own wars which is one of the best ancient histories that have come down to us. It is called Caesar's Commentaries, and it is used as a textbook in all schools where Latin is taught. This famous Roman was tall, handsome, agreeable in his manners, and of a gay disposition. He liked songs and stories, and even when he was a great general, he often was as merry and frolicsome as a boy. Sometimes, however, he was stern and cruel instead of kind and forgiving. Caesar was a member of the Julian family, which was one of the first families in Rome. Four Caesars of this family had been consuls of Rome in one century. The aunt of Julius Caesar was the wife of the great leader Marius. Naturally, Sulla was Caesar's bitter enemy, and did all he could against him. In that young man there is many a Marius, Sulla is reported to have said. However, by keeping out of Rome, Caesar was able to escape the traps laid for him at Sulla's orders. As soon as Sulla died, Caesar returned to Rome. Although he was a rich noble, he became a friend of the plebeians and always supported their cause. He spoke a great deal in the forum upon political questions, and the people looked upon him as their champion. They elected him to several public offices, one after the other, and thus his influence and power were much increased. At last he was appointed governor of Spain, which was then ruled by the Romans. On his way to Spain, he stopped for a night at a little village among the mountains. One of his companions remarked that perhaps in that small place the people had their contest and their jealousies, as well as people in large cities. Poor as this village is, I would rather be first here than second in Rome said Caesar. Caesar was very successful in Spain, and the Romans were so pleased with his conduct that when he came home they made him consul. During his consulship he had many good laws passed. When about forty years old he was given command of an army, and for some years followed the life of a soldier with wonderful success. The Roman armies were formed of regiments called legions. Each legion contained over three thousand men, who were sometimes called legionaries. The weapons of the legionary were a short sword and a long spear called a pilum. Besides spears and swords, the Roman soldiers used slings for hurling stones against the enemy. They also had a machine called a balista for throwing stones too heavy for hand slings. The military standard of the Romans was a figure of an eagle borne on the top of a pole. Each legion had one of these, and the soldier who carried it was called the eagle-bearer. Other standards were also used by the cohorts, or companies, into which the legions were divided. Caesar's first great battles were in Gaul. The Romans called all the inhabitants of that country Gauls, although they were of many nations and spoke different languages. The Gauls were brave, but Caesar proved to be a great general, and in a few years he conquered all Gaul. The Roman soldiers had great confidence in Caesar. When he led them, they believed victory was certain. He was strict in his discipline, but very friendly and pleasant with the men, and he often gave them praise. He himself shared in their hardships. Day after day he marched on foot at their head through heat and rain and snow, and fought with them in the front ranks. On one occasion Caesar built a very remarkable bridge. He wanted to get across the river Rhine with his army, to punish some German tribes who were in the habit of attacking the friends of Rome in Gaul. There was no bridge. The Germans used to get over in small parties by swimming, or in small boats. But a large army could not cross in this way without a great deal of trouble and loss of time. So Caesar resolved to build a bridge. He quickly set his men to work, and they finished the bridge in ten days, though all the wood had to be cut down in the forest and carried to the riverside. One of Caesar's greatest victories in Gaul was the taking of Alicia. This town had very strong walls all round it and it was defended by a great army of Gauls, commanded by a brave chief named Vercingetorix. Caesar surrounded the town with his army, and prevented food from being sent in to the inhabitants. He also defeated an army that came from other parts of Gaul to help the Elysians. 
Vercingetorix then had to come out from the town and give himself up to Caesar. After many conquests in Gaul, Caesar sailed over with an army to the island of Britain, now called Great Britain. The natives were a wild, fierce people, and they fought bravely against Caesar and his army. But the Romans were victorious, and they took possession of Britain. And for over four hundred years the island was a part of the Roman Empire. 2. Caesar was engaged eight years in his wars in Gaul and Britain. It is said that during these years he conquered three hundred tribes or nations, took eight hundred cities, fought battles with three millions of men, and made a million prisoners. He obtained immense quantities of treasure in the conquered lands, and he himself, as commander of the victorious armies, kept a large part of it as his own share, so that he became very rich. Caesar's wonderful victories made him a great man in Rome. The plebeians rejoiced at the success of their leader and favorite, and were ready to welcome him with the highest honors whenever he should return to the city. But Caesar had now made up his mind to become the master of Rome, so he began to plan and to work to destroy the power of Pompey, who at that time ruled public affairs in Rome almost completely. In order to gain still greater favor, Caesar sent a number of his friends to Rome to spend immense sums of money in various ways to please the people. They got up splendid games and feasts, they divided large quantities of corn among the poor, and they paid the debts of hundreds of men who had influence among the plebeians. The people knew that all this was done at Caesar's expense, and they praised and loved him for his generosity. Pompey, with a great show of authority, now ordered Caesar to disband his army and send the soldiers to their homes, for he said that Caesar had no need of an army any longer, as he had finished his work in Gaul. But Pompey, too, had an army at this time in Spain, and Caesar said to him, If you will disband your army, I will disband mine. This made Pompey very angry and he got the Senate to pass a law declaring that Caesar was a public enemy and must be put down. One senator asked Pompey what he should do if Caesar should come to Rome with his army. What should I do? cried Pompey, in a tone of contempt. Why, I have only to stamp my foot, and thousands of men will spring up to march under my orders. At that time Caesar was with his army in the northern part of Italy. When he heard what the Senate had done, he called his soldiers together and made an eloquent speech. He told him of the injustice that Pompey and the Senate had done to him, and he concluded by saying, This is my reward for all that I have done for my country, but I shall go to Rome and establish an honest government of the people, if you, my brave soldiers, will be faithful to me. The soldiers answered with a loud shout, saying, We shall be faithful to you. We will stand by you to the last. Caesar then started with his army and marched rapidly through northern Italy until he came to the banks of a little river, at that time called the Rubicon, and known as the southern boundary of Gaul. What river this was no one can now exactly tell, but it is supposed that it was some one of several small rivers which flow into the Adriatic Sea south of the river Po. Caesar halted his army at the Rubicon, and forbade anyone to cross it until he gave the order. He stood for some time on the banks in deep thought, as if trying to decide whether he should cross the river and proceed, or give up his dangerous undertaking. He was still within his own territory as commander of Gaul. If he should cross the Rubicon, he would be on territory directly under the government of the officers at Rome. By law it was made an act of treason to be punished with death for any Roman general to enter this territory with an army without permission of the Senate. We can retreat now, said Caesar, to some of his officers who stood near him but once across the Rubicon, it will be too late to draw back. While Caesar was talking, a shepherd came along from a field close by, playing lively music on a reed pipe. The soldiers gathered around him to listen to the music, and some of them began to dance. One of Caesar's trumpeters stood among the soldiers, with his trumpet in his hand. The shepherd saw the trumpet, suddenly seized it, and walked to the bridge over the Rubicon, which was but a few steps off. Then he put the trumpet to his lips, sounded the stirring notes for an advance of the troops, and began to march across the bridge. A sign from the gods, shouted Caesar. Let us go where we are thus called. The die is cast. So saying, he turned his horse right into the stream and rode across the Rubicon, followed by his army. It was a daring thing, even for Caesar to do, and the phrases, he has crossed the Rubicon, the die is cast, are now often used to mean that a bold or dangerous step has been taken from which there is no drawing back. There was no one to oppose Caesar as he marched through Italy. On the contrary, 
city after city surrendered to him. There was very little fighting. In most places the people seemed glad to have him as their ruler, and gave him a warm welcome, and feasted his soldiers. He had only words of kindness for everyone, even for those who were against him, and he won hosts of friends and supporters all along his route. There was great alarm at Rome when it was learned that Caesar was advancing towards the city. The supporters of Pompey became terrified, and the rich nobles gathered up their money and other valuables and fled. Pompey could do nothing to defend the city against Caesar, and at last he too ran away. He went to Greece to raise an army to fight Caesar. When Caesar arrived at Rome, he met with no opposition. He entered the city amid shouts of welcome from the people. He harmed no one, but he set up a new government and organized a new senate. He was now the master spirit of the Republic. After arranging everything to his satisfaction in Rome, he went to Spain and defeated Pompey's generals there. Then he came back and turned his attention to Pompey himself. In the meantime, Pompey had been very busy gathering an army in the eastern countries controlled by Rome. In one way and another, he collected 50,000 men. They were stationed on the coast of Macedonia and Greece. There they waited for Caesar and his army to cross the Adriatic Sea to give them battle. Caesar had a great deal of trouble in getting across the stormy sea with his army of 40,000 soldiers, but at last a landing was made in Greece. Then the two armies had some skirmishing, but no great battle. This continued for months. Pompey at one time would gain the advantage, and Caesar at another time. But it was evident that neither of the great rivals was in any hurry to risk the chance of defeat in a general battle. They knew well that such a defeat would entirely ruin the one that was defeated. But at last the two armies met for battle on the plain of Pharsalia in Thessaly, a district of Greece. The soldiers on both sides were mostly armed with spears and broadswords. Some carried slings to hurl large stones, and others had bows and arrows. The greater part of the fighting, however, was done with swords. Eighty thousand men were engaged in the battle, about forty thousand on each side. It was a brave, heroic struggle, and lasted for hours. Both armies fought splendidly. But in the end, Pompey's army was forced back to its camp after dreadful slaughter. For a few minutes the camp was bravely defended against the attacks of Caesar's soldiers, and then had to be abandoned. The battle did not last long after this. Pompey's great army was utterly beat. Pompey himself, with a few followers, fled to the seashore and sailed across the Mediterranean to Egypt. There he was treacherously murdered by order of Ptolemy, the Egyptian king. Caesar gained a splendid victory at Pharsalia but he was not yet master of the Roman Empire. The rich nobles and senators formed armies to fight him in Asia Minor, Africa, and Spain. Caesar went with an army to Asia Minor, attacked his enemies, and won a great battle at a place called Zella. This victory was so quickly gained that in sending news of it to Rome, Caesar wrote the famous dispatch, Veni, Vidi, Vici, which is, in English, I came, I saw, I conquered. He had equal success in Africa and Spain. In a very short time he destroyed the armies opposed to him. Then he returned to Rome and had the grandest triumph ever seen in the city. The celebration lasted four days, and during that time Rome was in a high state of pleasant excitement. Thousands of persons from the surrounding country came to the city to witness the magnificent show. On each day there were splendid processions, in which there were great numbers of gorgeous chariots drawn by beautiful horses and filled with Caesar's principal officers. Behind them marched hundreds of soldiers bearing banners on which were pictured scenes from Caesar's important battles. Herds of elephants and camels from Asia and Africa appeared in the procession, and there were also long lines of prisoners, carrying valuable articles obtained by Caesar in the lands he had conquered. In addition to the processions, many kinds of entertainments were provided for the people, such as plays, circus exhibitions, combats between gladiators, wild beast hunts, and chariot races. There were also feasts served to all the people of the city. It was a time of unbounded enjoyment and delighted the Romans so much that they became very devoted to Caesar. There was now no opposition to him. Both the nobles and plebeians were willing, and even glad, to have him as their ruler. He was chosen dictator for life and put in command of all the armies of the empire. He was called Imperator, which means Emperor. The people gave him the title of Father of His Country. Statues of him were erected in the public buildings and squares. A grand chair, made somewhat like a throne, was placed in the Senate chamber, and whenever he came to listen to the debates he sat in this chair as if he were king. 
Caesar now had laws passed making many improvements in the government. He also carried out a number of plans to make Rome of more importance as a commercial city. He erected magnificent buildings, made aqueducts to bring plenty of water to the city, established a great library, and did many other things which were of much benefit to the people. One of the most useful things he did was to make a new calendar. Before his time, the Romans had not a very clear knowledge as to the length of a year. At one time they had only ten months in their year. Afterwards they had twelve, but they counted only three hundred sixty-five days in every year. They did not know or did not give attention to the fact that the real length of the year is three hundred sixty-five days, five hours, forty-eight minutes, fifty seconds. They did not reckon the extra hours, minutes, and seconds, and so their calendar got quite wrong in the course of a number of years. Caesar corrected the error by making one year in every four have 366 days, and the calendar thus corrected was called the Julian calendar. Caesar now possessed all the glory and power of a king, and it began to be believed that he wanted to be a king in reality. The Romans had not had a king for 500 years and would not have one. Their feelings against kings was so strong that none of the men who had ruled Rome, at times with almost kingly power, had ever dared to call himself king. One day an intimate friend of Caesar saluted him in public as king. Caesar replied, I am not king, but only Caesar. Some of the nobles, however, felt certain that he meant to make himself king, and they formed a plot to kill him in the Senate House on the Ides of March, that is, on the 15th of March. The Romans had certain days in their months which they called Calends, Nones, and Ides. One of the persons who made the plot against Caesar was Junius Brutus a highly respected Roman. It is said that he was a descendant of the Junius Brutus who, five centuries before, had helped to overthrow the tyrant King Tarquin. Brutus was an intimate friend of Caesar, but he thought that Caesar intended to destroy the Republic by making himself king, and therefore he joined the plot against him. As the Ides of March drew near, the plan for putting Caesar to death was carefully arranged and settled. An augur, or fortune-teller, one day stopped Caesar in the street and said to him, Beware the Ides of March. But the great conqueror laughed at the warning. On the appointed day, the plotters met in the Senate chamber, ready to do the wicked deed they had planned. When Caesar entered the chamber, all present rose to greet him. He bowed and smiled pleasantly to the people, and took his usual seat. Now was the fatal moment. As had been arranged, one of the plotters went up to him with a request for the pardon of a prisoner. Then the rest crowded it around his chair as if to urge him to grant the request. Caesar seemed somewhat alarmed at the crowd and rose from his chair. At this moment he was stabbed in the side with a sword. Then there were loud outcries in the chamber, and all was excitement and confusion. Caesar used a stylus to defend himself. The stylus was an instrument made of iron, with a sharp point on one end for writing on wax tablets, and with the other end smooth for rubbing out a word when necessary. For writing on parchment or paper, a pen made of reed was used. Educated Romans carried their stylus and tablet in their pockets. From the name of the instrument the word style is now used to mean a particular manner of writing. Caesar had nothing but his stylus to defend himself with. He fought bravely, until he saw his friend Brutus coming to strike him. Then he cried out, You too, Brutus? and made no further resistance. They stabbed him until he fell dead. Then they went out of the Senate and through the streets of Rome with Brutus at their head. They told the people what they had done, and rejoiced at the deed. They said the death of Caesar saved the Roman Republic. But the people were very angry, and threatened to put to death those who had killed Caesar. They would have done this, only that Brutus and his friends fled from the city. There was a grand funeral service in honor of Caesar. The body was laid in the forum, and a famous Roman named Mark Anthony made an eloquent funeral speech over it. He praised Caesar, and spoke so bitterly against Brutus and his party, that the people were more angry than ever. This Mark Anthony was afterwards a very powerful man in Rome. Caesar died forty-four years before Christ was born. Of course his death did not save the Roman Republic. It had indeed already ceased to exist in all but the name. Rome was no longer a republic, but an empire, and, as we shall see, the family of Caesar gave it its first emperor. All the emperors adopted the name of Caesar as part of their title. End of Chapter 21
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. Famous Men of Rome by John H. Haran and A. B. Poland. Chapter 22 Cicero. 1. Marcus Tullius Cicero was a prominent man at Rome for some time in the later years of the Republic. He was a great orator, one of the greatest the world has ever known. His principal speeches have been preserved, and are read and studied at the present day. He often spoke in the Forum before large audiences, and by his wonderful eloquence delighted all who heard him. Both the nobles and plebeians admired him for his learning, his oratory, and his manly qualities. Cicero was a tall, graceful man, with an intellectual and rather handsome face, and very bright black eyes. He was so great a favourite that he was chosen to fill several public offices, and at last was elected consul. In the early part of his year as consul, there was a mysterious plot formed in Rome by some nobles of bad character, old soldiers, and others ready for any mischief. What their real object was, no one seemed to know, but it was said that the conspirators wanted to overthrow the government and set up a new one of their own. There was a senator named Sergius Catiline, and many believed that he was at the head of the plot. He had a bad reputation, and for some time the other senators had looked upon him with suspicion. There was no proof, however, that he was engaged in any unlawful proceedings, so no charge could be made against him. But one day a young woman named Fulvia came to Cicero and gave him some important information about the plot and Catiline's part in it. She said that she had a lover who was one of the plotters, and that he had told her some of their secrets. She was greatly frightened, for she thought that there might be bloodshed in Rome if the plot went on, and she felt it her duty to tell Cicero about it. Cicero immediately went to the Senate and made a powerful speech. He charged Catiline with being the leading person in a plot to overthrow the government. There was great excitement at his words. Catiline was present, and he boldly denied the charge and defied Cicero to prove it. "'If Consul Cicero is afraid of my doing harm in Rome,' said he, "'I am willing to place myself as a prisoner in the hands of any senator.' "'I do not think it is safe to have you in the city,' replied Cicero. "'And do you expect any one to take you into his house?' After a great deal of exciting talk, the Senate laid aside the charges against Catiline for a while. 2. A few weeks later, in a city near Rome, there was an uprising of the people against the public officers. This caused a great deal of alarm, and Cicero said it was the beginning of the plot that he had charged Catiline with forming. Then he hurried to the Senate, where Catiline was, and made a great speech against him. He called him a traitor to his country. Catiline turned pale and began to tremble. He attempted to speak, but the senators shouted and hooted and hissed him. Those who sat near him got up in disgust and took seats in another part of the chamber, leaving the conspirator sitting by himself. At last Catiline ran out of the Senate, furious with anger and threatening revenge. Then he mounted a horse and rode quickly out of the city. Shortly afterwards, Cicero learned the names of nine Roman citizens who were leaders in the plot, and he had them arrested. He declared in the Senate that they had planned to murder the senators and the high officers, and to burn Rome. The senators declared at once that the nine must die, and so Cicero had them put to death. Catiline now fled to the mountains called the Apennines, and there raised a force of twenty thousand men. Two armies were sent against him from Rome. A battle took place, in which Catiline's army was defeated, and he himself killed. Thus ended what was known as the Catiline Conspiracy. Cicero's action in helping to destroy it greatly pleased the Romans. In the Senate he received much praise and honour. It was even declared that he was the father of his country. Antony did not like Cicero and when the triumvirate was formed, the great orator was put to death by Antony's order. End of chapter 22
of The Famous Men of Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Alec Datesman. Famous Men of Rome by John H. Horan and A. B. Poland. Chapter 23. Augustus. 1. The first of the long line of Roman emperors was Octavius, called in history Augustus. He was the grand nephew of Julius Caesar, although he was scarcely twenty years old when Caesar died. He was very ambitious. He often said he should one day be at the head of the Roman Empire. I shall rule Rome like Caesar, he would say to his companions. You may laugh at me now, but the time will come when I shall be master of the Romans. Shortly after Caesar's death, Octavius began to take an active part in political affairs. At this time, Mark Antony was in control of Rome, and he was managing everything to suit himself. He had been an intimate friend of Caesar, and commanded one of his armies. He obtained a great deal of power, but he was not liked very much either by the nobles or by the plebeians. He was a bad ruler, and nobody trusted him. Once Antony tried to prevent Octavius from being elected a tribune of the people. "'I will be a tribune in spite of you,' Octavius said, and he set to work with all his energy to get the office. There was a severe struggle on election day, but the boy was successful. After this, Octavius hated Antony, and planned in secret to bring about his downfall, and he succeeded in all he attempted to do. From a tribune he advanced steadily, step by step, to more important offices. At last he obtained command of an army, and marched his soldiers to northern Italy, where a war was going on. While in this region he met Antony with his army. The two began to quarrel, and at last came to blows. Then the army of Octavius fought the army of Antony, and the northern plains were reddened with the blood of the soldiers. When the fighting had gone on for some time, Octavius sent to Antony and asked him to stop it. He pretended that he was very sorry he had begun to fight with Antony, and asked for his friendship. "'Let us be friends and work together,' he said to Antony. "'By joining our armies we shall be able to do some good.' The fighting was then stopped, and the two generals had a meeting. They agreed to unite their armies, and to invite another Roman general, named Lepidus, who had a large army, to join them. Lepidus accepted the invitation, and came to have a talk with Antony and Octavius. They agreed to a plan by which they themselves were to rule Rome together. This rule, or government, was called the Triumvirate, and Octavius, Antony, and Lepidus were called Triumvirs, a word which means three men. 2. After making all their arrangements, Antony, Octavius, and Lepidus started for Rome with their armies and took possession of the city. Then they began to kill those that they thought were their enemies. More than two thousand Romans were slain. They would have killed Brutus, only that he was then in Greece, where he had gone after Caesar's death to raise an army to fight Antony and his friends. Antony and Octavius now went with an army to Greece to fight Brutus. Both armies met at Philippi, in Macedonia, and then there was a battle in which the army of Brutus was defeated. After the battle, Brutus requested one of his slaves to kill him. The slave refused, but when Brutus still pressed him to do it, he held out his sword and Brutus killed himself by falling upon it. It is told that some time before the battle of Philippi, as Brutus was sitting one night in his tent, a vision or specter appeared to him and said, I am thy evil genius, Brutus. We shall meet again at Philippi. It is also said that the specter again appeared to Brutus on the night before the battle of Philippi and told him that his death was at hand. There was no one now to interfere with Antony, Octavius, and Lepidus, and they managed everything in Rome as they liked. They pretended all the time to have great respect for the Senate and the officers of the government who had been elected by the people. After a short time, Antony went to some of the eastern countries that were a part of the Roman Empire, and Lepidus went to Africa. Octavius was left in Rome to attend to its affairs. He then began to plan to get rid of Antony and Lepidus so that he might rule Rome himself. With this object he raised a great army and determined to make war on his rivals. Sextus Pompey, a son of Pompey the Great, was at this time in control of the island of Sicily. He was always making trouble for Octavius, and he was aided by Lepidus, who had come from Africa to Sicily with his army. One day Octavius sailed over the Mediterranean Sea to Sicily with thousands of soldiers, destroyed the army of Sextus, and induced the army of Lepidus to leave him. Lepidus was then taken prisoner. Now put an end to the power of Antony, said Octavius to himself, when he returned to Rome from Sicily. So he went to the Senate and accused Antony of treason in Asia and Africa, and asked that war be declared against him. The Senate declared war, and Octavius began to make great preparations for it. Antony was in Egypt when he heard of the declaration of war. 
He laughed scornfully at the idea of Octavius being able to beat him. Then he gathered an army of more than a hundred thousand men and a fleet of several hundred warships, and set out to meet Octavius. He had with him Cleopatra, the beautiful queen of Egypt, whom he had married, and she had a fleet of her own, numbering sixty ships. Octavius had about as many soldiers and ships as Antony. The two fleets met near a place called Actium, on the coast of Greece, and fought a battle. For several hours the fight went on bravely, but neither side gained any great advantage. Suddenly Cleopatra sailed away with her fleet, and Antony quickly followed her with a few ships. Thus he deserted his men while they were fighting. The sailors and soldiers of the deserted fleet kept on fighting for a short time, and then surrendered to Octavius. A few days later a part of Antony's army, which was encamped on the shore near Actium, also surrendered. Antony went back to Egypt with Cleopatra. His friends and supporters then left him, and his power was gone. Soon after, he stabbed himself, and so died. It is said that Cleopatra died from the bite of a poisonous serpent called an asp, which she placed on her arm on purpose to kill herself. 3. Octavius continued to fight in different parts of the empire until he defeated every one who dared to oppose him. Then he went back to Rome with a great deal of glory and riches, and let it be known at once that he intended to be the master of the government. Although he pretended to protect the rights of the people, he made himself consul, and also assumed other high offices which greatly added to his power. Thousands of soldiers were at his call, and finally he became very much like a king. The Senate asked him if he would wish to be appointed dictator for life, but he thought it wise to refuse this office. The Senate then gave him the name of Augustus, which meant that he was worthy of respect. The word Augustus in the Latin language means sacred. He called himself emperor, and, as Emperor Caesar Augustus, he ruled the Romans all the rest of his life, a period of about twenty-seven years. And when Augustus became emperor, the Republic of Rome was no longer in existence. What was known as the Praetorian Guards were organized by Augustus to protect himself and uphold his authority as emperor. These guards were about ten thousand in number, and they were composed of the most trusty soldiers of the empire. Each soldier had high rank and large pay, and had to serve for many years. Whenever Augustus appeared in public, he was attended by some of the Praetorian Guards, and they looked very imposing with their handsome uniforms and glittering swords and spears. Augustus made many good changes in the government. He very much improved the condition of the plebeians. His principal ministers were two able men named Agrippa and Messenus, who gave him very valuable assistance. Whenever these wise men saw that the Romans were getting uneasy and beginning to grumble, they would advise the emperor to distribute corn or money to the poor, or to give the people grand exhibitions to amuse them. Augustus would follow the advice, and by so doing made himself very popular. During his long reign Augustus had many splendid palaces, temples, and other buildings erected in Rome, and they made the city very beautiful. Augustus also founded cities in various parts of the empire. He encouraged literature and art, and was himself an author. In his time the famous Roman poets Horace, Virgil, Varius, and Ovid lived, and also the great historian Livy, who wrote the history of Rome from the earliest period down to his own time. Virgil was the author of a celebrated poem called The Aeneid, which tells of the wanderings and adventures of the Trojan hero Aeneas, mentioned on page 9 of this book. It was in the reign of Augustus that Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, a town of Palestine, or Judea, in southwest Asia. Judea was then part of the Roman Empire. End of chapter 23 Recorded by Alec Datesman, Brooklyn, New York Twenty four of the famous men of Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Alec Datesman. Famous Men of Rome by John H. Haran and A. B. Poland. Chapter twenty four. Nero. One. On the death of Augustus in the year fourteen AD, his stepson Tiberius became emperor. He was a cruel tyrant. He put to death a great many people, only because he thought they were his enemies. A Roman emperor could put to death any one he pleased. If he did not like a person, he would charge him with some crime and order his soldiers to kill him. Tiberius had many people killed in this way, but he was himself killed by the commando or general of the Praetorian Guard. The next two emperors were Caligula and Claudius. They were also tyrants, and put many people to death without just cause. It is said that Caligula once wished that all the Roman people together had but one head, so that he might cut it off with one blow. 
But the next emperor was a still greater tyrant. His name was Nero. He became emperor in the year 54 AD. He was the son of a wicked woman named Agrippina. This woman married the emperor Claudius and got him to appoint her son Nero his successor instead of her own little son Britannicus. Then she killed Claudius by poison and Nero became emperor. Nero was a tall, strong, good-looking, bright youth. He was fond of games and could play well on several musical instruments. When he first became emperor, he seemed to be affectionate and kind-hearted, and he did a number of good things. Once, when he was asked to sign a warrant for the execution of a man condemned to death, he exclaimed, I wish I had never learned to write, for then I shouldn't have to sign away men's lives. Then all the people around him cried, What a noble young man our emperor is! What a good heart he has! But in a very short time it was found that Nero was not at all kind or merciful, but that he was a cruel and wicked man. His mother Agrippina expected that when her son was emperor, she herself would be the real mistress and would rule the Roman Empire as she pleased. Nero was only a boy, she thought, and he would not want to take upon himself the cares and burdens of government. And for a while Agrippina did rule Rome. She had a woman she hated, put to death, and she punished several other persons who had offended her. She made some of the richest Romans pay her large sums of money, but Nero soon put an end to his mother's power. One day he said to her, I, not you, am the ruler of the empire. You have no right to take any power upon yourself, and you must not do so again. Whenever you want anything done, you must ask me to do it for you. Ask you, cried Agrippina in a rage. How dare you talk this way to me, who made you emperor? You, the emperor. You are not the rightful emperor. The true heir to the emperor is your stepbrother, young Britannicus, the son of Claudius. Then there was a fierce quarrel between Nero and his mother, and at last he turned her out of his palace and ordered her never to appear there again. But what she had said alarmed him very much. He feared that Britannicus might be made emperor, and therefore he determined to get him out of the way as soon as possible. At this time there was in Rome a dreadful woman named Locusta, who made poisons and sold them secretly to anyone who wanted them. Nero went one night to this woman and said, Make me a strong poison, so strong that it will kill a person like a flash of lightning. Locusta made the poison and gave it to him. He tried it on a pig, and it killed the animal in a few moments. Ha! said he, this will do the work. Now Britannicus lived in the palace with his stepbrother, and next day, when dinner was served, Nero put some of the poison into a cup of wine, which he knew the boy was to drink. The moment Britannicus drank it, he fell to the floor dead. Then Nero said to the guests who were at the table, Do not be alarmed. It is nothing. My poor stepbrother was always subject to fits. The attendants carried the body of Britannicus out of the room, and the dinner went on gaily. 2. A little while after he had poisoned his stepbrother, Nero made up his mind to get rid of his mother also. He was afraid that as long as she lived, he would not be safe as emperor. She might stir up the people against him any day. So he went to see her and pretended that he was sorry he had ill-treated her, he kissed and caressed her so affectionately that she was entirely deceived. Then the cruel son made a plan to drown his mother. He had a ship so built that by pulling out certain bolts and pins it would suddenly fall to pieces and sink. He then hired a wicked captain and crew to do his bidding and got his mother to take a sail in the ship down the Tiber. Agrippina took a maid with her and went aboard. She was in a happy humor because her son, as she thought, was so kind to her. When the ship came to a certain place in the river where the water was very deep, the sailors pulled out the bolts and pins. Then the ship began to fall apart and sink. The sailors sprang into the river to swim to the shore, and Agrippina and her maid jumped overboard. The maid was killed by a sailor, but Agrippina was picked up by the crew of a fishing boat. Nero was greatly troubled when he learned of his mother's escape. He believed that now she would certainly try to have him removed from the throne, so he sent some men to kill her in her house, and they did so in a most cruel manner. 3. None of the emperors before Nero lived so grandly as he did. He had a splendid marble palace at Rome, containing immense quantities of beautiful furniture, gold and silver ornaments, and works of art of the finest kind. On the pleasant shores of the Mediterranean Sea, he had several houses where he lived in the summer and autumn months. Wherever he went he had, as his court or companions, three or four hundred richly dressed men and women, with many slaves to wait upon them. They traveled in chariots covered with ivory and gold and drawn by beautiful horses. Nero was famous for the splendid dinners he gave in his palace. The rarest and most costly food and wines were spread upon the tables in great plenty, and when the feasting was over, troops of actors and dancers would give performances which lasted until late at night. Sometimes at these dinners, Nero would play on a harp or flute, 
and sometimes he would act portions of plays or recite poems which he himself had composed. He was a very clever musician and actor, and he wrote very good poetry. One evening a fire broke out in Rome and raged furiously for a week. Half the city was burned, and hundreds of people lost their lives. Some of the Romans said that Nero had started the fire and had prevented it from being put out. Most of the six days during which the fire lasted, he spent in a high tower, enjoying the sight. He played on his harp, sang merry songs, and recited verses about the burning of the ancient city of Troy. After the fire was put out, Nero said that it had been caused by the believers in the religion of Christ. At this time there was a very large number of Christians in Rome, but most of the Romans still worshipped their old pagan gods, and they hated and ill-treated the Christians. When Nero declared that the Christians had caused the great fire, the people began to persecute them in a dreadful manner. Most of the Christians were hanged, some were covered with pitch and burned, and others were hunted to death by savage dogs. During the time of this persecution, the Apostle Paul was beheaded, and the Apostle Peter was crucified, as Christ had been crucified thirty-one years before. After a short time, Rome was rebuilt in a greater magnificence than before. Nero built for himself an immense and splendid palace on the famous Palatine Hill. This palace contained so many ornaments of gold that it was called the Golden House. In governing the empire, Nero was very harsh and cruel. He often put innocent men and women, and even his own friends, to death. He killed his wife in a fit of passion. He did so many wicked things that at last the Romans got tired of having such a tyrant to rule them, and they formed a plot to dethrone him and make someone else their emperor. But the plot came to nothing, because a slave who had heard of it went to Nero and told him all about it. The Praetorian guards seized the leading plotters and put them to death. Nero then became more wicked than he had been before. He even accused his old tutor, Seneca, and the famous poet, Lucan, of taking part in the plot against him, and he sent them an order to put themselves to death. Seneca was a very good man, and a great writer. When he received the cruel order from Nero, he knew that if he did not obey it, the tyrant would send someone to kill him. So he had the veins of his arms cut open, and he died after much suffering. Lucan also obeyed the tyrant's order. While dying, he repeated lines from one of his own poems. 4. This wicked emperor reigned fourteen years, but at last there was a rebellion against him, and the soldiers elected Galba, the Roman governor of Spain, to be the new emperor. Then Nero acted like a miserable coward. He was afraid to stay any longer in Rome, for most of the people hated him and favored Galba. So he mounted a horse and rode out of the city to the home of a trusty slave. But while he was there, he received word that the Senate had condemned him to death, and that horsemen had been sent out to capture him. Now dig a grave for me, he said to the slave, and I will kill myself. At this moment the galloping of horses was heard. Hark, they are coming to kill you, cried the slave. Use the dagger while it is time and save yourself from disgrace. With trembling hand Nero placed his dagger at his throat, but did not have the courage to use it. The slave then seized it and plunged it into the emperor's throat, and the wicked Nero fell dead. End of chapter 24 Recorded by Halleck Datesman, Brooklyn, New York Twenty-five of the famous men of Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Alec Datesman. Famous Men of Rome by John H. Harron and A. B. Poland. Chapter 25. Titus. 1. During the two years that followed the death of Nero, there were three emperors, Galba, Otho, and Vitilius. They were generals of Roman armies, and were made emperors by their soldiers, but they reigned only a few months each, and they did nothing of importance. Vitilius was a glutton. He took pleasure only in eating and drinking. He would often visit the houses of rich Romans without invitation, and take breakfast with one, dinner with another, and supper with another. After breakfast he thought only about dinner, and when dinner was over he began to think of what he would have for supper. The next emperor was Titus Flavius Vespasian, commonly called Vespasian. He also was an army general. When he was made emperor by his soldiers, he was in Palestine. He had been sent there by Nero with an army to punish the Jews who had rebelled against Rome. As soon as he was declared emperor, he returned to Italy, and left his son, Titus Flavius, called in history simply Titus, 
to carry on the war against the Jews. Titus captured Jerusalem after a siege of six months, and his soldiers took possession of all the valuable things they could find. Then they burned the city to the ground. The famous temple was also destroyed, and thus was fulfilled the prophecy of Christ that not one stone of the building should be left upon another. When Titus returned to Rome, he had a grand triumph, and a beautiful arch was built in his honor. This arch is still in existence. 2. Vespasian died in 79 A.D., and then Titus became emperor. One of the remarkable things Titus did during his reign was to finish the Colosseum, which had been begun by his father. The Colosseum was the largest theater in the world. It had seats for over 80,000 people. It was first called the Flavian Amphitheater from the family name of the emperors who built it. Inside, it had seats all around the ring, or arena, and as the word amphi means around, they called the great building an amphitheater. In later times, it got the name of Colosseum. The Greeks used the word Colossus as a name for any very large statue, and because the Flavian Amphitheater was so large, it was called the Colosseum. In our own language, we use the word colossal to describe anything of immense size. In the Colosseum, they had many kinds of amusements. When it was first opened, the shows and games lasted for a hundred days, and five thousand wild beasts were killed in the arena by gladiators. The arena was a vast space, fenced round about with a strong wall, and around it were circular tiers or rows of seats, one behind the other, like steps of stairs. Sometimes the arena was turned into a lake by letting water flow into it from pipes. Then they put ships upon it and had sham fights in imitation of a battle at sea. This sort of show was called Nomechia, which means a fight with ships. It was first introduced into Rome by Julius Caesar, who had a lake dug for the purpose in the Campus Martius. The Colosseum is still in existence, but it is partly in ruins. From the picture, which shows it as it now is, we can form an idea of how grand a building it once was. Besides finishing the Colosseum, the Emperor Titus also built splendid baths. They were called the Baths of Titus. The Romans were very fond of baths. Wealthy citizens used to bathe several times every day, and often they spent the greater part of the day at the baths, where there were finely furnished rooms. It was in the reign of Titus that the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum, in the south of Italy, were destroyed by an eruption of Mount Vesuvius. A famous Roman author, Pliny the Younger, saw the eruption from a distance and wrote a description of it. He tells that a fiery cloud of cinders, stones, and ashes burst from the top of the mountain and rained down upon the country all round, destroying towns and villages and people. The ruins of Herculaneum were accidentally discovered by workmen in 1709, and the ruins of Pompeii were discovered some years later. Titus was a very good emperor. He always did everything he could for the welfare and happiness of the people, and he was so much liked by everybody that he was called the delight of mankind. It is said that one night he thought he had done nothing during that day for the good of any person, and that he cried out, I have lost a day! End of chapter 25 Recorded by Alec Datesman, Brooklyn, New York Chapter 26 of The Famous Men of Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Alec Datesman. Famous Men of Rome by John H. Harron and A. B. Poland. Chapter 26 Trajan. 1. On the death of Titus, his brother Domitian became emperor. He was a very bad man, and took pleasure only in doing cruel and wicked things. It is said that one of his amusements was catching flies and sticking them with pins. Once, when a visitor called and inquired whether there was anyone with the emperor, the servant answered, No, not even a fly. It is not to be supposed that such an emperor could have been liked by the people, even his soldiers hated him, and at last they formed a plot against his life and killed him in his own palace. Nerva, who had been a favorite of Nero, was the next emperor, but
when he was an old man and died after a reign of two years. He was succeeded by his adopted son, Trajan, who became emperor in 98 AD and reigned for nineteen years. Trajan was a good man and a brave soldier. At the time he became emperor, he was governor of one of the Roman territories or provinces in Germany along the banks of the Rhine, and he resided at Colonia, now called Cologne. Not long after his return to Rome, Trajan was engaged in a war with the king of Dacia. This was the name of the country lying north of the Danube River. The greater part of it is now called Hungary. The Dacian king, whose name was Decebalus, had frequently made raids into neighboring countries which belonged to Rome, and robbed and killed many of the people. Trajan resolved to punish Decebalus, and so he set out with a large army and marched into Dacia. The war continued three years, for the Dacians were brave and skillful fighters. But at last Decebalus was defeated in a great battle, and he had to come to Trajan and humbly beg for peace. He agreed to be a vassal of Rome, that is, to hold his kingdom subject to the control of the Roman emperors. But in less than a year, Decebalus again attacked his Roman neighbors, and Trajan had again to march against him with an army. The Dacians were once more defeated in a great battle, and Decebalus, after failing in an attempt to escape, put an end to his own life. Dacia was then made into a Roman province. During this year, Trajan built a remarkable bridge across the Danube. Before that time, bridges were built of wood, but in the bridge over the Danube, Trajan used stone for the piers, which were of great size. The bridge had twenty-two arches, and its ruins, which are still to be seen, show what a wonderful work it was. When Trajan returned to Rome after his victory over Decebalus, he had a grand triumph, and there were games and shows in his honor, which lasted a hundred and twenty days. It is told that during these celebrations ten thousand gladiators fought in the amphitheater, and eleven thousand wild animals were killed in the arena. A marble column was erected in honor of Trajan's victories in Dacia. This monument is still standing in Rome. It is called Trajan's Column. Many scenes showing battles at other events in the Dacian War are engraved upon it from the base to the top. 2. Trajan also had wars in Asia, and he won many victories. He conquered Armenia, and Mesopotamia, and added them to the empire. But he did not live to return to Rome. He died in a town in Asia Minor, which in honor of him was afterwards called Trajanopolis. The Romans were much grieved at the death of Trajan, for he had been a good emperor and had done much to benefit the people. He built fine roads and canals and bridges in Italy and the provinces. He greatly improved and beautified the Circus Maximus. This was the place in which the Romans had their horse races and chariot races. It was built in the hollow between the Palatine and the Aventine hills, and it had seats for 250,000 people. Trajan also made a forum in Rome, which was called, after his name, the Trajan Forum. In the center of this forum, the Trajan Column was built, and around it were temples and libraries established by the good emperor. For a long time after Trajan's death, the people of Rome, whenever they got a new emperor, used to wish that he would be as great as Augustus and as good as Trajan. Some great writers lived in Rome in the time of Trajan. One of them was Plutarch, who wrote the famous book called Plutarch's Lives. This book, which you will perhaps some day read, contains an account of the lives of many great men of Greece and Rome. The historian Tacitus, the poet Juvenal, and Pliny the Younger, already mentioned, also lived in the time of Trajan. Pliny the Younger was so called to distinguish him from his uncle, Pliny the Elder, who lived in the time of Nero and was the author of a celebrated work on natural history. End of Chapter 26 Recorded by Alec Datesman, Brooklyn, New York Seven of The Famous Men of Rome This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer Famous Men of Rome by John H. Horan and A. B. Poland Chapter 27 Marcus Aurelius 1. The next emperor was Trajan's cousin Hadrian. He was a good ruler, and did a great deal to improve the city of Rome. 
he traveled through many parts of the empire to see that the people were justly governed and that the public officials were doing their duty. He visited Britain, which was then a Roman province, and he caused a strong wall to be built from sea to sea across the country near Scotland, to prevent the fierce tribes of the north from making raids upon the Roman settlements in the south. Some of the remains of this wall are still to be seen. Hadrian also built a great tomb in Rome, which was called Hadrian's Mole. He and many other Roman emperors were buried in this tomb. It is now known as the Castle of St. Angelo. When Hadrian died, a very good man named Antoninus was made emperor. He showed such filial regard for Hadrian, by building a temple in his honor, that he was called Antoninus Pius. Under the emperors who ruled before his time, the Christians were very cruelly treated. They were not allowed to have churches or places of worship, and numbers of them were put to death in the most shocking manner. Often Christians were thrown into the arena in the amphitheater, and devoured by wild beasts. In those times the Christians of Rome held their religious meetings in underground passages dug for burying places. These catacombs, as they were called, were near the walls of the city, and altogether were hundreds of miles in length. Along both sides of the tunnels were openings, one above another, in which the dead were buried. Many of the catacombs have been explored in recent times. They are among the sites which visitors to Rome are always eager to see. Antoninus Pius was very friendly to the Christians. He gave orders that they should be allowed to practice their religion, and that anyone who interfered with them should be punished. The next emperor of Rome was a very remarkable and a very good man. His name was Marcus Aurelius. He governed the empire justly and well for nearly twenty years. He began to reign in the year 161 A.D. He was the adopted son of the good emperor Antoninus. For some time before the death of Antoninus, he held a high office and helped to govern the empire. As soon as he became emperor, Aurelius invited a young man named Verus to share the throne with him. Verus had also been adopted by Antoninus. The generous act of Aurelius surprised everybody. Never before was there a Roman emperor who wanted to give half of his power to another person, and it seemed strange to the people that Aurelius should do so. But Aurelius said, I think my adopted brother has a right to be emperor with me. And so Verus was made emperor with Aurelius, and for the first time Rome was ruled by two emperors. Verus had a great respect for Aurelius. He seldom attempted to do anything in matters of government without asking his advice. But he did not have much to do with public affairs. He cared very little about being emperor, and generally spent his time in amusing himself. He was not a good young man, and his conduct gave Aurelius a great deal of sorrow. But after nine years Verus died, and Aurelius was the sole ruler during the rest of his life. In his youth, Aurelius studied under the best teachers in the empire, and so had an excellent education. He always had an eager desire for knowledge, and was constantly learning. Even in war times, when he was fighting in the field, he carried a library with him, and could often be seen in his tent engaged in study. He was one of the most learned of the Roman emperors, and his intimate friends were scholars and authors. When a boy of only twelve years, he joined the Stoics. These were followers of a famous wise man, or philosopher, of Greece, called Zeno. This man taught that the people should act according to reason and virtue, and should keep an even temper and a brave heart under all circumstances. He taught also that men should show neither joy nor sorrow, but control their feelings and passions, and submit without complaint to what could not be prevented. The followers of Zeno were called Stoics, from the Greek word stoa, which means a roofed colonnade or porch. It was in a roofed porch at Athens that Zeno taught his doctrine. The Emperor Aurelius was one of the best and most earnest of the Stoics. He carefully trained himself to control his feelings at all times, and to do his duty honestly and faithfully. The Romans never had a purer or nobler emperor, or one more respected and beloved. 
His style of living was very simple. He had no idle courtiers at his house, and he kept only a few servants. He gave no costly dinners and entertainments. He spent much of his salary to improve the condition of the poor and to provide good schools for their children. He used to walk through the streets of Rome in plain clothing, attended only by a favorite slave. He returned the greetings of the people with bows and pleasant smiles. Anyone could go to him and talk freely, and he encouraged the people to tell them about their troubles so that he might understand how to help them. He gave the Senate a great deal of power, which he thought it ought to have, and gave back to the people many rights and privileges which former emperors had taken away from them. No wonder the Romans loved him and called him a good man. 2. But the reign of Aurelius was full of troubles. In the first part of it, the Tiber one day overflowed its banks, and the waters swept away a large portion of Rome, destroying many lives. After this there were dreadful earthquakes, very destructive fires, and other serious misfortunes. There were also many wars. There was a war with the Parthians, a brave warlike nation in Asia, who destroyed a Roman army and then invaded Syria. Large armies were sent against them, and they were soon conquered and forced to pay homage to Aurelius. The Parthian horsemen had a strange way of fighting. They were armed with bows and arrows, and small spears called javelins, and were mounted on very swift horses. They would make attacks on the rear lines of the Romans, and when the Romans turned to attack them, they would lash their horses and ride off as fast as the wind. And while their horses were going at full speed, they would turn in their saddles and cast their javelins, or shoot their arrows with wonderfully accurate aim. After the Parthian War, there were wars with a number of wild tribes living in the countries now called Austria and Hungary. The tribes there rebelled against their Roman governors, and Aurelius had years of hard fighting before he could subdue them. He was himself a remarkably brave and able general, and gained many splendid victories. So at last, he taught the barbarians to respect and obey the Romans who governed them. Once, while Aurelius was fighting a tribe called the Quedi, his soldiers were hemmed in by the enemy, in a small rocky valley, and suffered greatly from thirst. Suddenly the sky darkened and rain fell in torrents. The thirsty soldiers collected the waters in their helmets and drank it eagerly. While they were drinking, and their lines were in confusion, the Quedi suddenly attacked them in large numbers. The Romans would have been cut to pieces, but that there came a violent hailstorm, with lightning and thunder, which stopped the battle. When the storm had ceased, the Romans, much refreshed by the rainfall, boldly fought the Quedi and won a great victory. Some of the Romans believed that the sudden storm which relieved them so much was caused by the magical power of an African wizard who was with the army at the time. But there was also with the army a legion of soldiers, some three thousand in number, who were Christians. The Christians had prayed for rain, and they believed that the rain came in answer to their prayers. They said it was a miracle sent by God to prove the truth of Christianity. Now Aurelius was a pagan. Some of his Christian soldiers had tried to convert him to their faith, but they had not succeeded. He lived and died a believer in the pagan gods and goddesses. After the strange storm, however, he seemed to have a greater respect for Christianity, and he named his Christian legion of soldiers the Thundering Legion. 3. Once, the commander of the Roman armies in Asia, a man named Avidius Cassius, planned a rebellion against Aurelius. When everything was ready, Cassius declared himself emperor and started with his army to Rome to take possession of the city. Aurelius collected his troops and went to meet Cassius, but no meeting took place, for Cassius was killed by his own soldiers, and the rebellion quickly came to an end. Those who had aided Cassius were brought before Aurelius for punishment, but the emperor would not punish them. No, I will not harm them, he said. I think I have governed the empire too faithfully and liberally to fear plots. I can afford to forgive traitors. Let all the friends of Cassius go free. They are to be pitied rather than punished. 
Aurelius was always very industrious, and would never waste any of his time. It was a part of his duty as emperor to attend the games and sports in the Colosseum and the circus. Aurelius cared nothing for such sports, and whenever he attended them, he always spent his time at some useful occupation while sitting in the splendid chair of state provided for him. Sometimes he would study his favorite books, and make notes from them, and sometimes he would dictate letters and government orders to a secretary. Thousands of excited Romans around him would be shouting their delight at the sports in the ring, but Aurelius would go on calmly with the work he had in hand. I do not like to waste my time by sitting here doing nothing, he would say. To waste time is one of the greatest of crimes. And so, by never allowing himself to be idle, Aurelius was able to do many useful things. He established good schools and hospitals in Rome and other cities of Italy. He introduced new trades, so that the poor people could get a much better living than before. Aurelius always gave great encouragement to art and literature, he welcomed authors and artists to Rome, and was always their friend. He established libraries and halls of paintings and statuary. He himself wrote several books. It is said that with all his virtue, the life of Aurelius was not a happy one. He had serious troubles at times in governing the empire, and the cares of a ruler often weighed heavily upon him. His wife, whom he dearly loved, behaved very badly, and caused him much anxiety, and his only son was a very bad young man. So, in the latter years of his life, Aurelius always appeared melancholy. A smile was seldom seen upon his face. He died at the city now called Vienna, in Austria, A.D. 180. End of chapter 27 Famous Men of Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. Famous Men of Rome by John H. Haran and A. B. Poland. Chapter 28 Constantine the Great. 1. For more than a hundred years after the time of Marcus Aurelius, none of the Roman emperors did anything great or remarkable. They were nearly all bad men, and many of them were put to death for their evil deeds. In the year 307 AD, the empire had been divided up through many quarrels and wars between generals of the armies. Often an army would declare its commander an emperor, and he would set himself up as ruler of part of the empire. So, in this way, there came at last to be six persons who claimed to be emperors. None of them was in any way remarkable, except the emperor Constantine, called Constantine the Great. He was the son of a former emperor named Constantius. When Constantius died, the army chose Constantine to be emperor. But he did not go to Rome to be crowned. He remained in Gaul for he learned that five others had taken the title of emperor in different parts of the empire. After a while, however, Constantine got messages from people in Rome, begging him to come and relieve them from the cruel government of Maxentius, who was acting as emperor there. But Constantine was a wise man. He thought it would not be well for him to leave Gaul and enter into a fight with Maxentius, so he paid no attention to the messages. At last, Maxentius openly insulted Constantine and threatened to kill him. Then Constantine was aroused to anger, so he gathered a great army of good soldiers and set out for Rome. He marched over the Alps and in a short time was fighting the army of Maxentius on the plains of Italy. The first battle took place near Turin. The soldiers of Maxentius were clad in steel armor but Constantine's men fought them so fiercely that their armor was of little use to them, and they were speedily defeated. There was another battle at Verona, where Constantine was again the victor. The third battle took place on the banks of the Tiber, near Rome. Maxentius had more soldiers than Constantine, but he was not a good general, so he was easily beaten. 
he himself drowned while fleeing across the Tiber. After the battle, Constantine entered Rome amidst the cheers of the people. A little while afterwards, he told an interesting story to a Christian bishop named Eusebius. He said that while he was marching through northern Italy, on the way to Rome, he was constantly thinking about the Christian religion. It had been spread in every civilized country for more than two centuries, and Constantine thought that he too should become a Christian, and no longer worship pagan gods. But he could not make up his mind to do so. One day, while he was in front of his tent, with his officers and troops around him, there appeared in the heavens an enormous cross of fire. A little on one side of the cross were these words in the Greek language, By this conquer. The words are sometimes given in the Latin form, In hoc signo, vinces, the translation of which is, Through this sign thou shalt conquer. Constantine was astonished at the wonderful vision, and he gazed at it until it faded away. He could not understand what it meant, and was greatly troubled. But that night he dreamed that Christ appeared to him in robes of dazzling white, bearing a cross in his hands, and that he promised him victory over his enemies if he would make the cross his standard. Constantine now declared himself a Christian, and had a standard made in the form of a cross, with a banner attached to it bearing the initial letters of the name of Christ. This banner was called the Labarum, and it was afterwards the standard of the Roman emperors. When Constantine became a Christian himself, he began to take the Christians into his favor. He made some of them high officers of the government, he built Christian churches, and destroyed the pagan temples. He also made the Christian religion the religion of the empire, and he had the sign of a cross painted on the shields and banners of the Roman armies. Thus, after many, many years of terrible persecution, the Christians were befriended by the Roman emperor, and soon they became very powerful. Thousands of Romans were converted to Christianity, and the churches were crowded with worshippers. 2. Constantine also very much improved the Roman laws and system of government, he put a stop to the dishonest practices of the officers and established just methods of carrying on public affairs. He disbanded the famous Praetorian Guards, which had been an evil power in Rome for centuries. Many other reforms were carried out by Constantine, who seemed anxious to do what was right and what was for the best interests of the people. Under Constantine's rule, therefore, Rome was happy and prosperous, to show their gratitude to him for his noble deeds, the people erected in his honor a grand marble arch in the central square of the city, and inscribed on it, To the Founder of Our Peace. Four of the six emperors, who had at one time ruled the empire, were now dead. But in the east there was one emperor named Licinius. Constantine attacked him, scattered his armies, and took away from him the greater part of his territory. The two emperors then became friends, but after some time they had a quarrel and went to war again. Each had a large army and a fleet of warships. Two great battles were fought, and Constantine won both. Licinius soon afterwards died. Now for the first time, Constantine was sole emperor, and for more than fourteen years he ruled the immense Roman emperor. He built the most magnificent palace Rome had ever seen. He surrounded himself with hundreds of courtiers and lived in great splendor. After a time, he resolved to move the capital of the empire to a more central place than Rome, and he selected Byzantium, an ancient city of Thrace, at the entrance to the Black Sea. To this city, Constantine sent numbers of workmen to make alterations and improvements, and he changed its name to Constantinople, which means City of Constantine. He spent vast sums of money in erecting gorgeous buildings, making aqueducts, constructing streets and public squares, and in doing the many other things proper to be done in the capital of a great empire. The finest statues and other works of art that could be obtained in Greece, Italy, and the countries of Asia were brought to make Constantinople beautiful. When everything was ready, Constantine, with the officers of his government, removed to Constantinople. 
He lived for about seven years afterwards. There were no further wars, except a slight conflict with a tribe called the Goths, and the people of the empire were contented and prosperous. Constantine died in Constantinople at the age of sixty-three, after a reign of nearly thirty-one years. He was the first Christian emperor of Rome. End of chapter 28「Famous Men of Rome by John H. Hahn and A. B. Poland Chapter 29 End of the Western Empire most of the Roman emperors after Constantine were either cruel tyrants or very worthless persons, who spent their time in idle pleasure and neglected their duties to the people. A few, however, did some remarkable things, and therefore deserve to be mentioned among the famous men. One emperor, whose name was Julian, is called in history Julian the Apostate, because he gave up the Christian religion and tried to establish the worship of the pagan gods again in Rome. Julian also attempted to rebuild the temple of Jerusalem, which, as we have seen, was destroyed by Titus. There was a Christian prophecy that it would never be restored, and Julian thought of rebuilding it to prove the prophecy false. A story is told that as soon as the men began the work, Balls of fire burst from the ground close by them, and they had to stop. They tried again and again, and the same thing happened, and at last they had to give up the work altogether. Not long after he became emperor, Julian set out with a large army to conquer Persia. For a while he was very successful and defeated the Persian king in many battles. But one day he was shot in the breast by an arrow, and he died soon after. It is said that while he lay wounded, he cast a handful of his own blood toward heaven, crying out, Thou hast conquered, O Galilean. By Galilean he meant Christ, who is sometimes called the Galilean, because he was brought up in Galilee. Not long after the reign of Julian, there was an emperor named Valentinian. He made his brother Valens emperor of the eastern part of the empire, while he himself ruled over the western part and for many years afterwards the empire was ruled in this way by two emperors, one called the Emperor of the East and the other the Emperor of the West. On the death of Valentinian, his son Gratian became Emperor of the West, and a talented soldier named Theodosius became Emperor of the East on the death of Valens. Gratian was weak and unfit to rule, and he was killed by a Spaniard named Maximus, who made himself emperor of the West. Theodosius fought Maximus and defeated him, and afterwards had him put to death. Then he made a son of Valentinian, emperor of the West, as Valentinian the Second, and gave him as his advisor a chief named Arbogastes. But Arbogastes was soon the real master of the Western Empire. One day Valentinian was found dead in his bed, and Arbogastes then made Eugenius, a teacher, the emperor. Theodosius, who well knew that Valentinian II had been murdered, made war on Eugenius and Arbogastes, and defeated them, and, until his death a few months afterward, Theodosius was emperor of both East and West. Theodosius had been a wise ruler, but he did one very bad thing. The people of Thessalonica, a city of Macedonia, a country north of Greece, had killed their governor because he had put one of their favorite circus riders in prison. When Theodosius heard of this, he was very angry, and he gave orders that they should be invited to a show in the circus, and there put to death. This cruel order was carried out. The citizens of Thessalonica were invited to come one day to the circus to see a grand show. Thousands came, and as soon as they had taken their seats, a troop of soldiers, under the command of one of the generals of Theodosius, 
entered the building and massacred them all without mercy. Over six thousand men, women, and children were killed. At this time Theodosius resided in Milan, a city of North Italy. At the same time there lived in Milan a bishop named Ambrose, who was a good and holy man. When Ambrose was told of the massacre at Thessalonica, he was greatly shocked. He severely reprimanded the emperor, and would not permit him to enter the door of the church until he had done penance for the sin he had committed in so cruelly putting to death many innocent persons. The successor of Theodosius as emperor of the West was his son Honorius, who reigned for twenty-nine years. But the actual ruler during all that time was a soldier named Stilicho, who was the emperor's guardian. Honorius was a simpleton and had no desire or ability to attend to the affairs of the government. The Goths and Vandals and other barbarous tribes from the north and east of Europe now began to overrun the western empire and to threaten Rome itself. Twice the great city was actually captured and plundered, the first time by the Goths under Alaric, and next by Vandals under a bold warrior named Genseric. About those barbarian chiefs and their exploits, you will perhaps read, in Famous Men of the Middle Ages, a companion volume to this book. To defend the seat of their empire against the attacks of its enemies, the Romans were obliged to withdraw their forces from several of the outlying provinces, including Britain, which was now left to its native inhabitants. For more than fifty years afterwards, a number of men, without much ability, took part in ruling what was left of the once mighty empire. One of these was called by the high-sounding name of Romulus Augustulus. He was the son of Orestes, the general of the army of Italy, and had been made emperor by his father. He was the last of the western emperors. Among the Italian soldiers there was a huge half-savage man named Odaka, who belonged to a wild northern tribe. He was a favorite of the army because of his courage and strength. He resolved to be the ruler of Italy, so with the army at his back he put Orestes to death, took Romulus Augustulus prisoner, and forced him to give up the title of emperor. Then Odoacer became king of Italy in the year 476 A.D. By this time the world had nearly entered that period which is known as the Middle Ages, and many of the other countries, which had been parts of the Roman Empire, were either ruling themselves or defending themselves against new invaders. Gaul was invaded and conquered by German tribes called Franks, from whom the country subsequently got the name of France. Britain, abandoned by the Romans, was soon after conquered by other German tribes. And so at last the great Roman Empire had crumbled to pieces, and Rome, so long the mistress of the world, as she was called, had fallen from her proud position of grandeur and power into that of a second or third-rate city. But the empire of the East continued to exist for centuries afterwards, with Constantinople as its capital. It included many of the countries of Asia, Africa, and Eastern Europe, which had formerly belonged to the undivided empire. In course of time, the power of the Greeks, aided by the influence of the Greek division of the church, became supreme at Constantinople, and so the empire was also called the Greek Empire, and sometimes the Byzantine Empire, from the ancient name of the capital. In the 14th century, the Turks, or Mohammedans, then very powerful in southwestern Asia, began to make inroads on the empire. They conquered and took possession of several of its provinces, and, in 1453, they captured Constantinople, which has since been the capital of the Turkish, or Ottoman Empire, the ruler of which is known as the Sultan. End of the chapter 29 And the End of Famous Men of Rome by John H. Hahn and A. B. Poland